Hi, my name is Farhad Zafezi from Zurich, Switzerland, and I'm here right now in Istanbul at the ESCRS Winter Meeting. This afternoon I will speak in a session on keratoconus management, and the topic of my talk is should crosslinking be the preferred initial mode of treatment in keratoconus? And that's an interesting topic. So when preparing the talk, I try to look at what are the goals we want to achieve when a keratoconus is diagnosed. On one hand, we want to medically make sure that the progression of the disease is halted. So stop the progression. On the other hand, what interests the patient most and what should interest us the most is visual acuity. So on the other hand, visually we need to increase visual acuity and increase the quality of the image. So once keratoconus is diagnosed, we basically could have different modes of approaching the disease. The classical old-fashioned mode would be to say, I do clinical follow-ups and monitor progression and if progression is too far advanced, I have to perform keratoplasty. We would all agree that nowadays this is a no-go, this method is obsolete. Other methods would include implantation of infrastromal rings, could include fake lenses to correct for the regular portion of the astigmatism, or old-fashioned contact lens adaptation or scleral lens adaptation. The disadvantage in this method would be we do not stop the progression of the disease. We take care of the patient visually, but keratoconus might evolve. The third option would be cross-linking alone, with the ob obvious advantage of uh, quite high uh, safety for arrest of progression. And option number four would be cross-linking in combination with other techniques. And I think options three and four, cross-linking or cross-linking in combination, are what nowadays is mostly used in modern management, besides the contact lens in initial stages. So looking at these two modes, we have to assess, should we perform cross-linking alone and then take care of the visual aspects at a later stage? So sequential approach, or can we do it simultaneously? Now you all know what happens in a cross-linking procedure in the first years after the procedure. The curvature of the cornea might stay stable, it might not, it might flatten, and it might flatten over time. Now, we all also remember out of our medical studies the famous Gaussian distribution curve. And the Gaussian distribution is what we have to deal with when we work in a living tissue. Because I am not speaking about the standard average flattening that is reported to be around one and a half diopters and that we see in many people. If this were the case, frankly, I would, not, I would not bother too much whether or not I do a simultaneous or a sequential treatment because the variation that is brought into the game by cross-linking is rather small. What is much more important are the outliers, and you can have two outliers. 3% of all procedures fail, no arrest of progression. And I speak of epi of standard trace and protocol cross-linking. So what happens if I combine such cases with rings or even with the PRK where I remove more tissue? Failure of arrest means something is fishy with this cornea biomechanically and even cross-linking couldn't halt. And on top of this, I did a PRK and I removed even more tissue. So unknown territory there. In, in the case, uh, in the case of, of failure of progression, uh, failure of arrest and continuous progression with uh, rings, well then we have to deal with the keratoconus progressing, same for fake lenses. The other extreme of the Gaussian curve would be not failure, would be too much effect. And indeed, we have um, published on this in 2012, we see with an incidence of roughly half a percent an extreme flattening effect in cross-linking. I do not talk about 1.5 diopters, I talk about 10 diopters or 11 diopters. Now what happens in these cases when you perform a simultaneous treatment? Well, you will be way, way off the target refraction. Let's say you do a PRK and of course you want to mainly regularize the cornea, but if you have this additional unforeseen flattening, you might find yourself at plus eight diopters, which was not intended. So in conclusion, my approach would be first to assess whether the cornus is progressive. If it's progressive, perform a cross-linking, wait 12 months, 
and check whether the cave readings are stable. And if they are stable, then you can proceed with, uh, with visually enhancing procedures. If they are not stable, alternative one, a failure, I would re crosslink. Alternative B, massive flattening, well, wait until, see until you have reached the plateau and the, the cornea is stable. And there are, of course, always exceptions to the rule. This I would do in the majority of patients. But if a patient tells me that he is contact lens intolerant and has a degree of visual acuity that is completely, uh, that, that completely keeps him from performing his daily tasks, then, of course, you have to enter into the equation earlier and talk about, uh, talk about potential offs of the refraction with the patient and proceed with the simultaneous treatment. Thank you. My financial disclosures, I am a co-inventor on two patents on cross-linking technology and I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Imagine ASA.